Good afternoon and welcome to today's McGill Alumni webcast. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement. Beyond the obvious health issues, one of the largest casualties of the COVID-19 pandemic has been the economy and specifically small businesses. Since the beginning of March, at least 66,000 businesses have folded in the United States alone, according to data compiled by Yelp, the online platform popular with local companies advertising their services. And yet just last week, in the midst of the pandemic, McGill announced that he'd received a $3 million gift from the John Dobson Foundation, its largest ever, to drive innovation across McGill and provide support to the university's aspiring entrepreneurs through the Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship. And though one might think this is the absolute worst time to launch a new venture, history is full of businesses that got their starts in the middle of wars and economic depressions, companies like General Motors, Disney, and Hewlett Packard. So maybe the Dobson Foundation and the community of McGill entrepreneurs it supports are onto something by doubling down on startups at this unique point in our history. Let's find out. It's Thursday, July 23rd, and in this week's McGill Alumni webcast, The Survival of Startups in the Time of COVID-19, we sit down with three representatives from the Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship to explore the challenges and opportunities facing startup businesses today. Let's meet our panel. First, we have Marie-José Lamoth, who is the Academic Director of the Dobson Center and a Professor of Practice at McGill's Deshotel Faculty of Management. Before entering academia, she enjoyed a prolific career in marketing and consumer products, including stints as Chief Marketing Officer and Chief Communications Officer for L'Oréal Canada, and then as Canadian Managing Director for Google. Welcome, Marie-José. We also have with us Dino De Palma, who is the Chair of the Dobson Center's Advisory Board and a serial entrepreneur, a Montreal native and McGill graduate, BA90, he was instrumental in the creation of two startups, including one, Acme Packet, which was eventually sold to Oracle for over $2 billion. Today, he serves as a member of G20 Ventures, which provides early traction capital for technology startups. He joins us today from his home in Boston. Welcome, Dino. And finally, we have Ophelia Sarakinis, who's a recent graduate of McGill's Farm Management Technology Program at McDonald Campus and co-founder of Vertite, a startup urban farm growing fresh strawberries in Montreal's West Island. While she was a McGill student, Ophelia spent many months availing herself of the guidance and mentorship offered by the Dobson Center, and we'll find out if those skills have prepared her for doing business during a pandemic. So welcome to all three of you. What a pleasure it is to have a chance to speak about this topic today. Before we jump into the conversation, a reminder that if you are watching live and have questions for our panel, you can send them in by email to aoc at mcgill.ca, and we'll try to address them to our guests. So before we delve too deeply into the issues facing startup ventures in this current economic climate, I'd like to find out a little bit more about the Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship in order to better frame today's discussion. Uh, so Marie-José, as the center's academic director, maybe we'll start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the Dobson Center, its mission and vision, and the role it plays in supporting McGill's student entrepreneurs? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Derek. Uh, the Dobson Center is really the hub of entrepreneurship for all of McGill University. So we will work with the 10 faculties and the innovations stem from the faculties, from students and professors. These, fa these um, innovations need to be turned into ideas that, be that need to be turned into a viable startup. And that's where the Dobson Center plays a role. It helps bring those ideas and this innovation into viable startups that we, and then we accompany the startups until they are what we call investment ready to meet people such as Dino, for instance, who have the expertise in examining a business model and startups and weighing the pros of the con and investing and scaling in those startups. Today, okay. I could say, if I could just add. Yeah, go um, ahead, yeah. It's thanks to the, the work that's been done from all my predecessors, we are very fortunate to be able to say that the Dobson Center today represents 400, over 400 active startups that do business in over 32 countries currently. Together, they've raised $770 million, and mostly they have created nearly 6,000 jobs. So there is a huge direct impact uh, of that these startups are having in their immediate communities. Wow. And that's that's the, yeah. very much that sounds the, Yeah, sorry. They're very much <laughs> the benefit of these startups, yes. <laughs> that's great. That sounds incredible. I, I'm anxious to hear a bit more, especially about how things are uh, operating during the, the current uh, economic climate that we're in. Uh, but Dino, I'd love to have you jump in here. Um, as someone who's seen the tremendous impact uh, that entrepreneurship can have 
uh, not just personally, but more broadly on creating jobs, revitalizing communities, and sometimes even giving birth to entire new industries. What value does an entrepreneurship center like Dobson bring to a university like McGill and a community like Montreal? Well, let's first start. I mean, I, I moved away from um, Montreal about 25 years ago. And when I was doing undergrad work at McGill and, and graduate work in Montreal, the idea and concept of entrepreneurship was unknown. It's not something that we really talked about, even taking business classes. It might be, you know, a very small section of a chapter, but it wasn't in our DNA. And when I personally moved to uh, the Boston area to join a few friends to do a startup, I realized that there was great opportunity to build some amazing businesses. You could get capital. One of the companies we raised over uh, $10 million. And that simply did not exist at McGill when I was there in, in the 90s. And when I came back to help out with the Dobson Cup or the, uh, to be part of Dobson and the Dobson Cup, I quickly realized, especially from one of the professors, and he deserves a shout out, Professor Vitt, really started to put together a very small team with very small resources. He was actually what a startup is in many ways, and he started to build that concept. And now I look six, seven, eight years later, uh, we're mentoring a ton of new opportunities and young entrepreneurs. We have a center that stands for entrepreneurship, not only for the business school, but across McGill and across the community. So the big change to me is now we're making that part of our DNA. And you need help. You need a community to have a successful startup. We'll talk about individuals later, but you need resources. You know, how do you get funding? Where do you go? What are the best practices? And Dobson is providing all of that, which did not exist, uh, as I said, 15, 20 years ago. And it's just continuing to gain momentum. And I'll close with when I first got introduced to uh, Dobson was actually here in Boston. I was invited to uh, an MIT event. And Professor Vitt happened to be there. And I can tell you the McGill students um, fared extremely well. And I'll be a little biased, if not better, than some of the, the, the folks from you know, the, the better even known name schools. But what I will say is that that's when I realized that we were on the road to doing something great. And then uh, Professor Vitt said, why don't you come and join us and, and help out? And I've been involved, I think it's seven, eight years uh, ever since. Great, great. Well, that's a wonderful introduction. And I think, I mean, I know Jose referenced it earlier, but so my understanding is um, this is not just open to business students or students of the Deselotel Faculty Management, but it's really students across uh, all 10 faculties and across the university who can take advantage of the services, correct? Correct. I mean, and I will tell you, you know, most startups that I've seen succeed are across multiple disciplines, whether it's social uh, whether it's in the uh, health and food industry, uh, whether it's in uh, tech. Uh, and I think what you find, especially when you look at McGill, with all the different departments we have in having been involved in Dobson, it could come from, you know, the medical department, the engineering department, or a socially based uh, creation that helps, uh, you know, people maybe wash clothes. There's a bunch of great things that they've been doing. I mean, one of the teams I'm still mentoring uh, invented the electric snowmobile. So it's across the board. And I think what McGill could bring along with its students and professors and the alumni is a great combination of ideas. And we'll speak more about this, but you know, startups are built with the right team in place, not just with one individual who happens to have a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Great. So before we bring you in, Ophelia, I just have one more question for Marie-José. Uh, I mentioned earlier this incredible gift of $3 million from the Dobson Foundation that was just announced last week. I'm curious, from your perspective as academic director, what sort of lift uh, this donation is going to bring to the center and to McGill's aspiring entrepreneurs? Uh, the gift is extremely timely because we feel at McGill right now a huge need and momentum for entrepreneurship. There's truly lots of innovation stemming from all those faculties and they are all looking for some mentorship and some advice in order to turn this into viable startups. So the, we'll, the three million will help us in three ways. The first one is to scale our current programming so that more startups can participate and be admitted and be part of these programs. The second one is we're, no, we're also seeing a need to customize some of our program for, to some realities. A good example is the new program we're starting in September with the neuroscience um, team at Miguel. So 
um, we will be essentially doing programs, entrepreneurship kind of programs for researchers in neuroscience who really have a whole lot of innovation in mind and are trying to commercialize it and just needs to get that little push along the side to take into them. So there's a huge program that's starting in the fall that will be dedicated to the neuroscience team, I'll call it. Uh, this said, um, um, there are other faculties right now who are actually asking for similar kind of programs. And thirdly, what we're looking at is uh, what's important is to have a hub where all entrepreneur or like-minded people can really work and network and help each other out, whether they come from the medicine, engineering, or other kind of faculties. It's good to have a space where we can all work together. And uh, up until now, the Dobson Center was always renting locations and spaces here and there on the McGill campus. So uh, we are at about a year's time starting to um, will be open a big pace that will be called the Dobson Center space. It's right on Sherbrooke Street at the bottom of Days Hotel, so prime location for students, where we will be able to give all of our workshops, encourage networking, uh, do a whole lot of training, et cetera. So it's a mixture of all of those three things that uh, will um, really be helpful thanks to this gift. Great, great. Thank you for that. So, Ophelia, thank you for your patience um, and for joining the panel today. Let, let's find a little bit more about you. So, um, so you grew up in the West Island suburb of Dallard des Ormeaux, uh, which also happens to be where I grew up and currently live. Um, so for fun, I did a little bit of research ahead of today's webcast. Um, and it looks as if there has not been an operational farm in Dallard uh, since the last pumpkin patch closed on Sources Boulevard in the 1980s, um, which begs the question, how does a kid raised in Dallard today <laughs> decide they want to become a farmer? So since I was a kid, uh, I love nature and taking care of plants has always been a passion of mine. Uh, during high school, I was determined to figure out what to do with this passion. So I decided to volunteer at Cap Saint-Jacques Farm in Pierrefonds for two summers. And I knew immediately that I was meant to be a farmer, but I had no background in farming and needed education. That's when I found McGill's Farm Management and Technology Program. During my studies, I learned a lot about sustainability. We had classes called pesticides in the environment, conservation of soil and water. And I realized that agriculture is often done inefficiently and unsustainably. Um, the technology is improving and agriculture is evolving to be more sustainable. But I learned about indoor farming, which can be way more efficient than conventional agriculture in some important ways. Apart from efficiency, indoor farming also enables farmers to bring food production into cities where most consumers are actually located, and I'm also a city person. From the moment I learned about it, I was deeply interested in building the sustainable urban farm system to supply people with extremely local food. The concept of an indoor hydroponic farm was conceived in 2018. For most of the year, strawberries don't look so great and don't taste great either. That's because they're bred for travel, not for flavor. Imported strawberries are also more likely to be contaminated with pesticides. I wanted to produce something that is fresher, more local, sustainable, and pesticide free. Thankfully, my parents offered to help me buy a small hydroponic test unit. So that's why I was able to start testing and growing my strawberries while I was finishing my studies. The last year of my program at McGill focused on developing our own enterprises. So I was prepared to start my business immediately after graduating. So that's, uh, that's how I got started. Great. So if, if my mom is watching now, and I, I, think, I think she is, she's probably wondering now why I didn't go into farming as well as a career. But, <laughs> um, so tell us a bit about your operations now. So you're, you're now actually growing uh, strawberries. Uh, I think you told me earlier in an underground parking garage. So yes. how, how, is, how, how is that set up and how does that work? And, and how do you or where do you sell your strawberries? So that's the thing. So the first farm is a prototype farm. It's located in Kirkland, as you said, in an underground garage. So we're making use of space that otherwise would not be used. So Verité, the company, produces local pesticide-free strawberries all year long. Um, the goal that we have is to have a system of urban farms in Montreal area within the next five years and then expand into the rest of Canada into the major cities. What our farm does, like the way we're able to do it, um, we use vertical hydroponics to maximize the space efficiency. We use LEDs that are customized to maximize our yields and to grow as much strawberries as possible. Um, and we have automated control systems to reduce our labor costs. With all this tech, we're able to grow more with less. So as a result, the farm uses significantly less water, land, and fertilizer compared to conventional agriculture. 
and zero pesticides. On top of all that, the quality of fruit is much higher than what you would find in the grocery stores. We also chose to grow a certain variety that is extremely delicious. And right now we're selling it through home delivery. Um, I'll, I'll mention how we kind of changed our business model. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about how you adjusted during the pandemic. Well, pandemic. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, maybe just uh, I assume also. I know. I guess you've also went through the Dobson program as well and benefited from their services. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about that? Yes. So I started in the Lean Startup program, which is uh, basically if you have an idea. Um, I had already developed my business quite a bit, but it was extremely beneficial. We we looked at a whole bunch of entrepreneurial. Um, let's say foundation building uh, concepts. And then after that program, we went to the Dobson Cup and I'm competing next week in the finals. So I'm very, very excited about that. And again, we, there's workshops that are offered that are really, really beneficial for anybody who's starting a business um, and opportunities to network with other companies. And then now we, I am in the X1 Accelerator program offered by the Dobson Center. And it is uh, going to help us develop our pitch so that we can pitch to investors and get real funding. It's, it's, it's the real thing now. <laughs> wow, sounds great, sounds great. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me circle back to a question I referenced in the introduction of the webcast. Um, so with the pandemic still a major health concern and, and so much economic uncertainty in the air, it seems like it would be an awfully bad time to be starting a new business. On the other hand, with so many service provider, pr providers closing down and no longer providing goods and services, this might be the perfect time for an aspiring entrepreneur to launch a new business. So I guess my question is, which is it? And maybe I'll start with you, Dino. Um, good time, bad time? I, I think as long as the idea uh, that you're developing will be able to uh, be a business that can exist during the pandemic and after and have that adaptability. Uh, and what Ophelia is doing is a great example. It's like MIT speaks about this, is what's the job to be done? Um, and if the job to be done, for example, in the tech area of AI is to help um, increase you know, productivity, how you do uh, automation in, in a better way. Uh, maybe it's telemedicine where we know that's going to be something that will survive both pre and post uh, pandemic. Is it around what I call unified communications, kind of what we're using today, but unified communications on steroids where it becomes more of a 3D like gaming environment. What are you going to develop that will be capable of surviving pre and post. And what I will tell you is that I know there is uh, money available for investment uh, across uh, the US and Canada. In fact, I just helped uh, one of our portfolio companies uh, during this pandemic uh, raise $6.2 million and we were oversubscribed. So the venture capitalist world is looking to invest. They actually believe that there is the opportunity to find companies that will be successful, as I said, pre and post. Um, and if you think about it that way, as you as your mindset of developing a new idea, uh, you'll find success and you will find uh, a very receptive audience uh, because technology innovation won't stop just be, because of the uh, of, of the pandemic and the VCs realize that and are willing to make the right investments for the right team and for the right technology. Okay, great. How about uh, your thoughts on this, Marie-Jose? I know you're, you know, academic director of the center during a pandemic. You've also, in your, you know, consumer marketing career, lived through probably lots of ups and downs, including the, the last recession of 2008. So what are your thoughts on this being a good time or a bad time for, for new, new ventures? I think it's um, what startups have as a huge competitive advantage over even a small, medium-sized enterprise or a larger corporation is that they are they can be very nimble and quick on their feet. So what, like COVID, what did, did that create mostly to me? It's a, a quick overnight change in demand and services, no matter which industry you are. So if a company very much like Ophelia can uh, adjust their business model just as quickly and to be able to be nimble and then serve, in this case, more online consumers. I think it's uh, 
it's what they can do. Larger companies have a legacy and they have a culture also to, to really change. Whereas when you're a startup and you're just a few people, the mindset, the culture and the big investments are not legacy that you need to address. Uh, what we often tell them is, look and build a business model that will make you ready for their times where the economy is very strong and when it's very difficult and very much like when you manage a portfolio, you just need to have a very diversified business model and startups can do that. So what we call the true omni-channel, they can have the equivalent of physical locations and brick and mortars, they can be online, but to have both and to marry both in a very um, inclusive manner, very omni-channel thinking, uh, generates revenue for a bit everywhere and doesn't create this dependency that some bigger corporation have. So we see that startups have um, an advantage, a real competitive advantage to disrupt very quickly the industry they're in, no matter which industry, whether it's like mm -hmm. Dino was mentioning telemedicine or hospitality or travel or farming industry, if you think of Ophelia. Um, but it does require to change and be very agile very quickly. And if I, mm -hmm. I could just add to that, I think that the technology that we have in place today lends itself to that flexibility. You know, we're on a, a, a we can do video calling, Zoom calling. Uh, there are collaboration tools like Slack that let you work within uh, a certain channel environment. And so the access to technology and tools from a communication standpoint that we have today lend themselves to startups not needing, you know, as we said, a physical building and being able to adapt quickly. Uh, certainly a big change that it would have been uh, from 15, 20 years ago without uh, the technology in place. We are now able to work in a virtual environment much more effectively. Mm -hmm. So I do want to come back to you in a minute, Ophelia, just to get find out a little more about the changes you had to make. But um, Dino, you did mention to me on a call we had last week that you think that um, the pandemic will ultimately accelerate innovation by 10 or 15 years. Can you explain what you meant by that and why you think this will be the case? Yeah, I do. Um, and, and the reason, and I'm, I'm seeing it already just in, in the environment that I'm in, is that we're being pressed for more solutions that can't wait. So let's take communications as we sort of talked about. Uh, Zoom calls are great, but they're not as effective or any type of webcast as a live in-person meeting could be. Well, what would be the next best thing? Almost think of Star Trek where you would have almost holograms where you would feel like you're in the meeting, you're there, you're able to interact with someone. I could actually be in your library. Uh, you, I know. I'm sure people on the webinar are thinking, oh man, they asked a lunatic to jo join the call, but those things are happening and they're <laughs> gonna be pulled in. Why? Because we have no choice now. We could have lived with Zoom for another 10, 15 years, but you know, we need alternatives to be able to communicate and do business more effectively. If you look at the telemedicine world, uh, I'm looking at people speaking to um, how we could improve our own personal health through telemedicine well, you know, now maybe a video call was okay, but as this continues, uh, it's going to have to leverage technology much more efficiently without getting too technical. You have the advent of 5G, which is just faster communications and services, which now will make telemedicine that much better. Well, I can tell you that there's collaboration happening between the companies today to accelerate that. And why? Well, because they know that we can't continue to stay stagnant in the world that we're in. So all of that is being brought in. And I would finally say, I think that's the only way we maintain uh, economic survivability is to bring in that innovation uh, to enable us to continue to build businesses like Ophelia is, is building. And without that acceleration, it won't happen. And I think we're pretty innovative people here and we'll make that happen. Uh, but no question that uh, the challenges ahead of us are just going to accelerate that. Okay, great. So, Ophelia, let me come back to you then. So, it sounds like you had a pretty solid business plan in place pre-pandemic and that's some really good mentoring and coaching from the Dobson Center. Um, so, what was the biggest sort of, uh, I guess, challenge for you uh, and your company as the pandemic hit in, in earlier this spring? And, and how did you make adjustments to overcome it? So during the pandemic, our farm operations were business as usual. My business partner and I would go into the farm, take care of the plants, harvest the fruit. It was really our sales channel that was disrupted the most. 
Our first point of sale was supposed to be the St. Anne de Bellevue a farmer's market, but just one week into production, uh, it shut its doors. So we had to adapt quickly. We saw what our customers needed during these hard times. After speaking with several of them, it was clear to us that a home delivery surface, uh, service would be preferred during the COVID times. So what we did is we shifted our business model. We digitized quickly and created a home delivery option and it became really popular. Great. Yeah. So I guess that's what Mario Jose was referring to earlier when you talked about the sort of agility of smaller companies being able to, to make these shifts, whereas larger legacy companies would probably uh, spend a few weeks having committees and task force to sort of, you know, to figure out if it's a problem to begin with. So, but let me sort of stick with you, Mario Jose, on that then. So at the outset, I listed a few very well-known companies um, that got their starts during these sort of times of hardship. Um, it seems counterintuitive that businesses that begin during recessions and depressions often do better than those that launch when times are good, um, yet that so often seems to be the case. Why do you think that is? Because if you learn to build a really high performing machine uh, that has very little consumption of fuel or electricity, if you're highly efficient from the get-go, it's a lot easier to scale, right? So if you're a startup with very little investment, but you're making your innovation highly efficient, you're commercializing it, with the right investment, step by step, it's going to be easy to scale once the economy comes back. So if you can be successful in more competitive times, I would call it, uh, then you're more likely and have solid foundation to scale rapidly when everybody else is getting back on their feet, you're already there. So I really mm -hmm. often compare it to, to that is you if you can go at a hundred kilometers an hour in difficult times, then you can go so much faster when everybody else starts joining in and, you know, purchase behavior starts to accelerate, et cetera, again. So I think it's a lot about being lean and efficient, you know, was referring to that and having the ambition to when in difficult times to have the vision of where you want to be once it's times are going to be good again, so that you end up having a very diversified way of approaching the market and being able to scale on many fronts. Okay. And I think that's what the, the positive of growing and building um, a startup in difficult times is you just learn how to do a lot with little. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and again, just a reminder for anyone watching us live right now, if you do have any questions for the panel or any of the panelists, uh, you can send them in by email to aoc at mcgill.ca and we'll try to get to a few of them uh, before we wrap up. Um, so just a question, maybe we'll go back to you, Dino. You referenced this earlier. We are talking about sort of businesses that need to be ready to, to go during a pandemic and afterwards. Are there certain types of businesses that you think would stand a better chance of succeeding now, starting out during the pandemic? You know, I'm thinking of companies that offer goods and services to a homebound population. You mentioned teleconferencing apps, you know, Ophelia mentioned grocery deliveries, or, or can really any new venture find success at this time if it has really the right idea and the right leadership? Uh, well, there's two questions there. I think any good idea can make its way as long as your go to market as Ophelia uh, did in her case, your go-to-market strategy adapts to the changing times, right? So you take classic examples of just local restaurants who have had to do a lot more delivery and maybe change their options on becoming almost a small grocery store. So how what your go-to-market is with your idea and how you track your your market, I, I think, is is one of the the, the critical uh, pieces to it. Do I think certain technologies will lend themselves a little more easily? I do. Uh, in fact, you know, we talked about telemedicine. That's certainly one area. I believe the whole area around uh, unified communications and the whole telco space will, will will play a role. But even you know, one company I'm involved in, which is around sales intelligence, and, and I won't put a plug in for it, but. Mm -hmm. You know how you do sales intelligence with this particular company I'm involved with now, we've went all virtual and any interaction you have is no longer in person, but all leveraging um, Zoom and different types of technology. Why is that important? Well, you still need, you know, what's the job to be done? You still need sales intelligence during this crisis to be able to understand your customers' needs. How do you get them can change. So I do believe that's the case. Now, the other question you asked around 
the the team that's involved. I'm always a big believer that in any startup, you have to build out a team where there's expertise in each area. Uh, you know, one of your team members should be the real innovator, the thinker of new ideas. Someone else has to be the person who can execute on those ideas. Another person could be the person who could go out and speak and evangelize. And very often, even I see it at the Dobson Cup, um, one of the, the, the advice that we often give as judges is they'll come in two or three and one is the CEO and he feels or she feels that because they're the CEO, they need to give the presentation. But in fact, they might not be the best public speaker, and that's actually okay. Uh, but the person who's doing their marketing is the best public speaker. They probably should present during this area and let the innovator be the innovator. So that team and what they do during your your process of building a business is really important. You know, and I'll end with this. You look at any startup, of course you'll hear the big names, like who invented the company. But go dig just a little deeper and you will always see there's at least a minimum of two or usually like a core team of three to five people who really made the company successful. And no question, the head person gets uh, you know, all of the, uh, the acknowledgements, but you just do one little layer and you'll see how that team was built to be successful. Mm -hmm. Great. So Mary Jose, let me sort of throw that question to you in terms of this, this notion of leadership. I mean, obviously you're now working with a lot of young aspiring entrepreneurs. So what traits or characteristics do you think an entrepreneur needs to succeed, especially during an economic downturn like the one we're living with now? Um, or is it really ultimately about the idea and the business model, less about the personalities? Well, before I answer that, I'll just say something that's really surprising me and that we're seeing steadily growing in the last six to nine months is the increased interest in developing um, some entrepreneurship skills from our students across all faculties. So I don't know if it's COVID or these circumstances, but students are really interested in developing skills to be less reliant on others and corporation and trying to figure out on their own how to scale their ideas or their business. And that I think is really interesting. There's huge interest in entrepreneurship. So for mm -hmm. one, one thing that um, I, the, the successful ones, whether they are with the startups on the side that I do work with or the small medium uh, businesses that I work with uh, or the ones at Dobson, the really successful ones are the ones that are humble in their success, right? So who are always looking for new ways to, to learn and to better themselves. So therefore surround themselves with people that are actually stronger than them on every given topic. That brings a lot of strong diversity of thinking within the startup, which really stimulates a lot of innovation and grows and reinvents go-to-market strategies and et cetera. Um, it's also, uh, of course, there's an ambition, but it's an ambition of uh, its resilience is sort of uh, um, uh, like the, the basic needs is that, you know, from the get go, and we'd never hide it, is that if you become to uh, an entrepreneur, you will have some highs and you will have some lows throughout your career. It will not be the beautiful sky with the, you know, the unicorn and the white clouds at all times. <laughs> Um, how, and how to address those times is also important and how to creatively problem solve when times get difficult. It's really a big part of the character that's required to succeed in entrepreneurship. And to back to your previous questions, why is it that some companies that can thrive in difficult times do so well after her, afterwards? Perhaps because they, by definition, have that common trait of resilience and hard time understanding that there will be highs and lows, but the vision and the mission in order to get there is clear. How to get there, however, will question will constantly be reevaluated given the context that they'll be in. Mm -hmm. So Ophelia, um, do you recognize yourself in any of those characteristics that uh, Marie-Josée just laid out for us? Sure, some of them, yeah. But I think what it comes down to is having uh, the ability to adapt, be observant and learn quickly. There's definitely characteristics that I had to develop and I'm continuing mm -hmm. to develop today. And the Dobson Center has been extremely helpful in accelerating my development as a founder, leader, and business manage manager. Mm -hmm. So, okay. definitely, uh, there great, are some great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so again, just uh, if anyone does have any questions watching live, if the email address again is aoc at mcgill.ca. We have received a couple, so I will get to them in a couple of minutes. Um, 
I just want to ask about a couple of other angles of entrepreneurship. Uh, Dino, I think you referenced this earlier in terms of the venture capitals, uh, but obviously every new startup, no matter how solid the business plan, eventually needs um, one very important ingredient to get going, which is money. Um, so are investors still keen to pour money into startups, even during the pandemic? Well, they are. And in fact, I'm part of a VC fund called the G20. I can speak directly to it. We just completed our third fund and the third fund is actively seeking and investing in uh, new new technologies. And I know we're not the, the only fund. As I said, one of the companies I'm involved with, uh, we were able to raise around and, and, and be oversubscribed. So the facts are there. You know, the, the VC world uh, is anxious to uh, make investments and look at technologies that they think um, will, will have success. And, you know, when you're looking at raising money from VCs, you know, one of the pieces of advice I, I always give is really understand the VCs that you're working with. What is their thesis? Who do they invest in? Why do they invest in? Do they invest in mainly technology companies? Do they invest in companies that have a combination of technology and human interest? Really get to know your VCs just like you would any other customer uh, to be able to gain traction. Uh, but to answer your 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 primary question is there's no question that the VC world is still very, very active. Uh, and we're seeing that um, across the U.S. Uh, you know, every day. And there are new opportunities being uh, brought to our portfolio uh, company, um, I'd say, at least weekly. Okay, great. Um, Ray Jose, what about the mood at McGill among the student population? You mentioned that, you know, everybody seems to want to, you know, become entrepreneurs or at least learn some entrepreneurship skills. But, you know, during the pandemic itself, uh, the last few few weeks, months now that we've been in it, what's the mood like at McGill and within the Dobson community in terms of uh, thoughts around innovation, entrepreneurship? Is it business as usual? I mean, obviously, there must be some challenges in terms of delivering some of the services that you normally would. So, well, like uh, most everyone, if not everyone, we have moved everything online. So all of our courses, workshops, et cetera, are now given on their format similar to this one with guest speakers, similar to what we're doing right now. Uh, the only thing missing, I would say, is that physical networking, but we try to encourage it uh, virtually. The the, the the energy is really surprising. I mentioned before, um, there's a real, there's an increasing need for entrepreneurship kind of mentoring and coaching because there's more and more so innovation coming out of the faculties. I'm impressed. Like when I talk to the faculty of medicine and neuroscience and engineering and science, et cetera, agriculture, um, the professors and the deans are actively involved now in developing and helping those students develop those ideas. And uh, to give you an example, our X1 Accelerator, which Philia is part of now, which is essentially once you have a really good business plan and you're looking for the summer to accelerate um, your, your thinking around getting investment ready, essentially, so that by the end of the summer, you can start pitching to real life investors, as Ophelia mentioned before. Um, typically, we'll have seven, eight startups every year that will be part of this program. This year, we have 20. And if we have 20, it's because we had a record level of applicants, among which 60 really strong startups that could have been part of the X1. We just needed to, to select 20. So I think there's a huge momentum. I think this is the time to um, working also in this manner it gives us more of the time to reflect and build on those innovation and try to scale them. And I think that's what all the faculties are currently doing as well. So we're working with researchers and professors and students, etc. And uh, the the mood is is extremely optimistic. I would say at Miguel, and it's just for us to. Uh, in a, a very convivial and inclusive manner, or try to make those innovation uh, erupt and go to market as quickly as possible. And that's essentially the goal of the Dobson Center. Okay, great. So let me turn to a couple of the questions that have come in uh, while we've been on air and a couple that we received ahead of time as well. Uh, this first one comes from Sebastien Prou. Uh, first of all, he says uh, he's in, this is an awesome seminar. So thank you, uh, Sebastien, for that. Um, his question, he says, generally speaking, uh, what is the view of the panelists on the place of NPOs in this new world? I presume it means nonprofit organizations. Um, and more specifically, does the Dobson Center support uh, nonprofit startups? 
Um, so I don't know who wants to jump in maybe on the first part of the question, uh, nonprofits and sort of companies that are there to do social good. Mary Jose, still a good sure. time? Uh, absolutely. All I'll say is among the Dobson Cup, we actually, we divided the Dobson Cup in several streams. And one of them is for actually what we call social enterprise, which almost 100% of them are non-for-profit. And then they're either non-for-profit, um, yeah, and, and all types of social. Debt. So do, yes, I think non-for-profit is a type of business model, if I can call it that way that's crucial to uh, the economy that, uh, for instance, I'm very involved with Centraide uh, in Montreal and we see how all the various non-for-profit in the city of Montreal alone are doing and contributing a lot to the community. So I agree with, I, I missed the name, but I think it's Julien or uh, perspective that keep, always keeping a stream and a thought around non-for-profit will be a crucial part of give, of um, giving back and having an impact in the economy for sure. Yeah, and, and I, I, I'll just add to that. Um, my wife happens to be quite involved in a few nonprofits. Uh, one actually is called the Food Project in Boston and another is Girls Inc. And talk about being innovative, what they have needed to do is find new innovative ways of raising capital, right? Because all of these nonprofits um, really rely on uh, fundraising. And one of their biggest events is a physical fundraise, right? Where you go and you bid on stuff. Uh, and they've had to be very creative on how to continue to do that. So, you know, the, the need to be nimble, as Marie-José spoke to in Ophelia, to be nimble, to have new creative ways of running your business has uh, impacted nonprofits, if not even more, to make sure they continue to do the great work that they're doing. So, uh, you know, they absolutely can also benefit from the teachings of, of Dobson and, and what uh, the Dobson is, is uh, providing the, the students and the faculty uh, on, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Here's another question that's come in um, as we've been speaking. I'll throw it out there. It's a bit interesting. It comes from Andrew Francis. So he says, he writes, given the stories we've heard about the toxicity of startup culture, including rampant incidences of racism, sexism, and ageism, why should we expect startups to be engines of general prosperity and fairness anytime soon? Um, tough question. Um, Dino, you want to jump in on that one? Sure. I, I, I think I'll, I, I have a perspective on that. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, when the early startups that I've been in, there was such a mission oriented goal that uh, a lot of that, um, at least for us, was was not an, a, a, an issue in that you just like work 80 hours a week to get the goal done. So you don't really care who's getting it done. You just do. But at the same time, structurally, where I think things need to change are at the board level. So you, you, you start to see even in startups quite a bit of diversity uh, at the startup level. But then when they form the board, uh, you know, they're all 50 to 65 year old, you know, white men. Uh, and that's an area where I think it needs to change where the board composition needs to be a lot more diverse. Um, and you look at a lot of companies that have had issues. There is no diversity uh, with at the board level. And it helps you frame thinking very, it helps you to frame a lot of your philosophy differently. So I think that's one area that could drastically improve in, in the startup area is the composition of, uh, of, of the board. Okay, great. So here's a question that's come in specifically for you, Ophelia, um, from Adam Nutby. Um, so he writes here, your business model seems excellent. Uh, do you have plans to sell small scale indoor farm setups to households? Or do you rather envision large vertité container farms all over Quebec and beyond? So yeah, we, we're going to be having uh, farms in major cities that are larger. We're, we won't be selling to individuals, um, but we'll have large farms that can produce uh, for the entire population, ideally. That, that's the goal. We can be almost self-sustainable in terms okay. of fruit, at least. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I can, I, is your plan to expand beyond strawberries at some point as well and have a, yes. a larger variety? Yes. So we're starting with strawberries because we want to just perfect that now. Um, but eventually we're going to be trying all sorts of crops, uh, blueberries, raspberries. We could do lettuce, herbs, but strawberries mm -hmm. are the priority for now. 
<laughs> okay. I know you mentioned um, earlier sort of, uh, you know, the future of farming could be urban farms. Do you see, like, if you, if you sort of fast forward, you know, later in your career, say 20, 30 years from now, um, do you think that generally societies here in North America are going to be receiving just a greater percentage of their produce from these urban urban farms? I think definitely. I think the technology is accelerating rapidly. It's getting more and more affordable. Um, and people are innovating. People are creating different systems, more efficient systems, systems that can grow other crops. Because it used to be limited to just a few crops, and now it's becoming more and more uh, diverse. Right. And I guess it fits into the whole notion around sustainability, correct? I mean, if we could get our strawberries here in Montreal from Kirkland versus California. Exactly. Um, it probably makes more sense and better for the environment. Yeah, yeah, and it tastes better too. <laughs> Great. See, if we were in a virtual world, Dino, she can just pass you some strawberries right That's... now and I can try them out for myself. <laughs> I I'm, I'm, I'm actually want to try one now. <laughs> uh, that's why we need better options in Zoom, I guess. <laughs> um, so here's another question that's coming. I guess I'll address this one to you, Marie-José, since it's very specific to the Dobson Center. It comes from mm -hmm. Ariel de la Loyer. He's a McGill graduate with a startup of his own and wants to know how we can meet or speak with someone in order to receive support for his startup whether it's advisory, financial, or other support. Um, is there a team of dedicated people to review business plans, financial plans, and marketing plans? And are these services available to alumni, and I suppose other members of the community? I think that's a really interesting and important question that Ariel is bringing up. Today, the Dobson Center really will help scale or create an idea, scale the business plan, and then scale the, the startups once it's shaped in order to get it ready for investors. But after that, we don't have anything. And there's a clear need for more Dinos of this world who believe in the cause and are willing to help out to, to do some matching and to do some real good, strong mentorship program. But for the mentorship program to be solid, we need to formalize it. And it's one of the ideas we have because I do agree with Ariel, it's a need that um, is required because once you graduate and you have your first round of investment, it doesn't mean that you're all that ready to scale and could you benefit from more mentoring and coaching? Absolutely. But then it becomes a question of matching the right mentor to the right uh, startup in order to, to be truly um, efficient. So it's definitely something we are currently looking at for, and this donation will certainly help us uh, scale in that manner as well. The only thing I would add to that is if you do participate in Dobson, you'll find opportunities, although unofficially, to do that. I mean, I've been helping this one particular yes. uh, individual, this woman who just recently sold her business, and I've known her now for three years, and she just um, closed the deal uh, and got acquired about a, a week and a half ago. And um, I've been speaking to her for three years, almost once every four to six weeks. And so, you know, my only advice to you is if you at least get involved, you'll find one of us uh, who's one of the judges, uh, whether it's Marie-José, myself or others, and there's a good community that will be willing to lend a helping hand until we make it more formal. Okay, great. So we just have a few minutes left um, before we wrap up. So maybe I'll just throw out one final question uh, to each of you. Uh, I'll start with, I'll sort of stick with you, Dino, if that's all right. Um, and that is, so what one piece of advice would you give to a young person, let's say a high school or university age uh, student who has a great idea and is not sure about whether it's worth making a go of it as a career? <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, I would say really understand if you're truly passionate about it. And if you're truly passionate about it, you should 100% go after it. Because, uh, and I bet you Ophelia, will, 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 this will resonate. If you're going to do a startup because you think you're going to work 20 hours a week and be your own boss and not have to answer to anybody, I say this is not the place for you. Because startups uh, are you know, 60 to 80 hours a week. They're never ending. Someone always has something that they want, whether you're working for your shareholders, your customers, you're always doing this to continue to, to, to support uh, the business. So if you're truly passionate about it, I say 100%. If you're not, it's no different than whether you want to become a hockey player or something else. I mean, you look at the top athletes, they actually practice more than anybody else at the end of the day, regardless of their talent. So find the passion if you're passionate about it 
Absolutely. But if not, um, you know, find something that you are passionate about. Okay, great. Uh, Mary Jose, advice you would give? Um, don't get, don't get discouraged with the first no's <laughs> because it takes a several no's before you get a yes. And, but every no is an opportunity to reinvent either your business model, your financial model, your go to, your go to market strategies, but that's where the resilience takes in and the ambition and determination, but it'll take a few no's to get a yes. Okay, great. And I figured we'd give the final word to our uh, youngest and most recent entrepreneur, Ophelia. Uh, you've just sort of, are still going through it, um, but had to make a lot of these decisions yourself very recently. Um, so what advice would you give to people who are maybe a few years younger than you who are thinking about, uh, obviously, if it's strawberries, you would tell them to go do something else. Um, but <laughs> someone who had a, a great business idea, what would you tell them? So uh, I would first recommend that they read Chris Hadfield's book, An Astronaut's Guide to Living on Earth. It has great advice for everybody, but especially entrepreneurs, I found. Something that resonated with me from the Dobson workshop is to identify a problem rather than starting with what you think is a solution. So often what entrepreneurs or people who want to start a business will do is they'll come up with an idea or a solution and then seek a problem that solves it. So once you have a problem that is significant, I recommend Start customer discovery right away. Ask everyone you know, strangers, if they need or want what you have uh, come up with. And if they do, build something real to share with them immediately. Don't wait uh, so that you can get their feedback. That, that's what I did. I just started immediately. I okay, think. great. That's, That's great advice. Thank you. And, and thank you, all of you. So uh, that about wraps up the time we do have today. Uh, before we close, I would like to remind you that this video will be available at this very same link soon after the recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may have not been able to tune in live. And if you're an Army Go graduate who is not currently receiving our emails would like to be added to our distribution list, you can visit alumni.mcgill.ca slash register to sign up. And the link will also be available beneath the video player on our YouTube channel. And I'll end with some words of gratitude. Uh, first, of course, to the John Dobson Foundation, including Foundation Chair Randy Kelly and President Ari Kiriazidis for their incredible and timely gift to McGill's Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship. And of course, a huge thank you to our panelists today, Marie-José Lamoth, Dino De Palma, and Ophelia Sarakinis for the gift of their time and insight as we tackled one of the more unique aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and of course, best of luck uh, to you, Ophelia, as you continue to, to grow the business, no pun intended. Um, please join us again in two weeks' time on Thursday, August 6th, when we shift gears and speak with two McGill professors who study technology, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. We'll look at some of the incredible societal benefits that these technological advances have brought to our lives, our health, and our planet, as well as some of the more ominous and ethical issues confronting those who create and make use of this technology. Until then, please stay safe, everyone, and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.